Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, today's message is uh, the Bible interpretation we're on now. Um, and last week, you may have, uh, you, you will remember, hopefully, uh, that we learned last week that uh, the inspiration of Scripture, uh, that Old Testament and New Testament is God-breathed, that it's all inspired by God, written by people uh, who follow him, who believe in him. Uh, so last week we learned about the inspiration, uh, and this week we're learning about the interpretation. How do we interpret? We learned that God authors the word using his people to write it down. God inspired people of the Bible to write God's word. So if we believe that God's word is his, then we believe that no scripture, no scripture is inspired by man, but God himself. God inspired men to write scripture. Not of themselves, but about God and what he said. So the, the scripture we're really going to kind of hang, we're going to uh, look at today. I'm very nervous. I'll press a button. I just wonder what happens when all technology fails. Uh, Joshua 1 verse 8 is our verse that we're looking at today. Um, and it, it will be in the worksheet, so I'll send out. But uh, it says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. So this is a, a great link, I think, into from last week because we talked about uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament being God-breathed. Uh, and when that, that, that first line, when I saw that first line, keep this book of the law, uh, people will say, well, that's the book of the law, that's the Old Testament. Uh, yes, uh, but also if we believe that New Testament is also God-breathed, then it has the same value uh, as the Old Testament. So I thought that was a really good link-up just to come into... And understanding. So this week we kind of overlap a little bit, uh, and this week we talk about Bible interpretation. And I need you to stick with me on this one because for, even for me there was revelation in this that they're, they're small detail, but they're really important to understand how to interpret the Bible correctly. And I've, I'm on no illusion that you might disagree with some of the things I'll say today, uh, just because that's just the way it is, and we can have a talk about that at some point. Um, so the fact that it is God's own written word as we look here uh, should lead us to this attitude of caution, uh, awareness of God's word. If God's word is treasure, if it's life itself, uh, then we need to approach it with caution, awareness, carefulness, and with meditation. God's word is not, not a collection of inspirational quotes. Psalms, Proverbs, is not a collection of inspirational quotes. It is God's Word. Now you might think, you might know actually, that there are different types of books in the Bible, whether that be poem, whether that be a prophecy, whether that be whatever you want to call it, it's still God's Word. It's still written by Him, and He has uh, asked, He has requested of men, as it were, He has inspired men for the Holy Spirit to bring a message to people. So books of the Bible have a specific message. They, he has asked, he has, through the Holy Spirit, delivered this message. So he says, I need you to tell people about this. It's not randomness. There's not some uh, random thoughts that are going on in the writers of the Bible. They're actually writing a message that God wants us to understand. It's not a collection of quotes. Uh, and as we saw last week, it is... Life itself, it says, uh, they are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Much in the same way, this still is relevant. Old Testament is still relevant. They're not just idle words for you. They are your life. That hasn't changed just because we now have the New Testament. It's still our life. The word is our bread. Something we live on. And just as God's people did... Uh, how we are to interpret Scripture correctly and understand it, how God wants us to understand. Just as the people in the Bible and those that received God's Word understood, understood God's message to them, so we are called to do the same. We are called to understand what God is saying in everything we read about Him. And so when we look at this, we're looking at interpreting meaning. Uh, this, is, this is where you need to... This is the point where I decided that we needed to reorder the service because this is where it starts uh, getting really quite intense. 
gets a bit technical, but we need to understand what interpretation is. We're in a time when we don't want to do that. We just want to make ourselves feel better by reading bits of scripture. And that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to do that. So we're here to, when we read the word, we want to interpret the meaning. And when applied to biblical text, it's very different than when we apply this to fictional books. Uh, If you read any kind of fictional book, if you read Lord of the Rings, whatever you want to think of, any book, um, that you can get whatever meaning you want out of it. And you can even probably say, oh, there's, 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 they're taking that from the Bible. You, you, can, you can dream up anything you want of fictional books and get any sort of meaning you want, any sort of understanding. It's open to all sorts of interpretation and meaning. But the Bible is not that. It's not a fictional book. It's not a book that is a random collection of words. It's not just a story. It means what it means. And I remember thinking about this. I remember some few films that have been out that are based on the Bible, based on certain books of the Bible, uh, based on history of certain elements of the Bible, maybe Noah and things like that. And when when most, most films, unfortunately, are not always accurate when they remake a biblical story Uh, but what's more so is that I noticed that when you watch the interviews of the actors and the directors and the writers whoever, one thing they say is that when they're asked about well um, what should people get from this film they say they should get what they want from it, they should get their own meaning from this film Uh, and I certainly remember this uh, of a film with, uh, I believe it was, it must have been Noah, which is Ru- uh, Russell Crowe, I think it was. And there was this uh, question over whether it was accurate or not, whether certain things were right. And they just kind of fudged the answer with, well, you know, we've just come up with a new way of telling the story. So whatever you want to believe, you can have it as your Bible story. So this is crazy. There's no need to make stuff up. The Bible, the, the, the history within it is already interesting enough without having to insert our own stuff into it. And they said, well, I think people could understand it for themselves. They can have their own interpretation. We wanted to give it a fresh look, a new way of looking at the story. Ah, it gets so tiring. A new way of... It's so hard to see and watch these films as they're creative with great intent and then just spoiled with human intervention. Uh... Not, not in a right way, not with God telling them, but with just added detail that didn't exist and doesn't need to be there. And in today's world, we see this happening again. Plenty of scope uh, so that people can make their own truths. We, we're meant to allow people to have their own truths about things. And that's, that's affecting the Bible as well. As we teach the Bible, we're not staying within Scripture enough. And there is a sense, in my view, that we're, we're kind of heading towards a time, and maybe we're already in it, where people are happy, even leaders are happy to see people have their own truth about Jesus. That, that's sad. That is, I've seen this, and just seeing people not have that depth in the Bible, but just having that kind of pick and choose of verses. No understanding of the context of what they're reading not taught about context. I don't think even in this church, for a long time, we've really spoke about interpretation and how to interpret God's word. I don't think we've done that, actually. I think we've spoken about how we can read the Bible and it's there to be picked up and it's there to be read, but I don't think we've gone into the detail enough uh, about how we interpret God's word. But the Bible is not written in this way. It's not written in a way where people can make their own truths. It's not written in a way where people can come up with their own version of what they think the Bible is saying. And I'm going to get into this. This is why you need to stay with me because some things you initially might disagree with me and then I'll back it up with some good argument and hopefully you'll end up agreeing with me. Hopefully. But the people that wrote down God's word had specific intentions which they wanted to communicate. And we learned two weeks ago... uh, about dispensations, didn't we? Periods of time where God said he's written or done something and used people, used God's people, 
to deliver that message. So his specifics, dispensation was actually specific times when God said, I'm now going to do this. We're living, the dispensation now is grace. We're actually living in a time of grace. And that's all in scripture as well. So actually the, God's trying to deliver this message to us of grace at this time. And people don't want to hear that message. People don't want to hear the message of grace because, as I've heard this morning, uh, listening to someone preach just before I came here, that people don't want to know about Jesus in that way because it means that my life might have to change. It means if I believe in Jesus, it means I have to look at my life and say, it's not going the right direction. Things that I've done are not right. And then I have to change what I do. I then have to accept that Jesus gave his life for me so that I may live again a new creation, a new life, not carry on in the old one. So God had a specific message to communicate to his people at specific times. Right now, a specific time of grace, he's communicating a message to us through the Bible. So when we interpret the Bible, when we look at biblical text, we sometimes get confused about, about feelings, about what we feel about the Bible. So when we're reading and, and we're trying to understand what is God saying in this message, uh, we need to understand that meaning and feeling are not the same things. I could feel a certain way, a certain emotion about biblical text, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't mean that's what it means. You understand? If I, if I have a feeling, if I feel a certain way about a text, that doesn't mean that's what the author, the writer, is trying to say. So what do I do? I read the whole chapter. I read it in context and say, what's the writer trying to say, that message that God gave them? Nothing wrong with feeling about the message. Nothing wrong with trying to engage with the emotion of the time. But we must go past that to get an interpretation of what the biblical text is actually saying. It's not every single thought that flows into our mind either. Just because a, a, a thought appears after reading text, it doesn't mean that that's the meaning. It's not how we feel about the text. How we feel about the text relates to our emotion, which is fine, but don't get it confused with meaning. Interpreting the meaning of biblical text is to understand the intention of the writer. It's to understand what intention did the writer have and what message did they want to communicate through that word that God gave them? So what happens is when we understand the writer's meaning, where we find that uh, they intended for us to know, what we find is they uh, intended for us to know, and therefore what God is communicating to us. When we understand the meaning, we understand what God is saying. I know this is starting maybe to sound like, yeah, that's obvious. If I understand what God said, then I can understand what he's saying to me. But I'm building up. I'm trying to let you have easy access to what we're about to get into. And the Bible, in the way it is written, has already taken into account the fact that everyone is able to come to an understanding of God's word. The way the Bible is written is enough for me to pick it up, you and me, to pick it up and just start reading. It's enough. I can stand here, many leaders and preachers can stand in their churches and they can teach the message. Nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, we all must all know the Word. We must all get into the Word ourselves. And the way God wrote is intentional because remember, He created us. It's highly unlikely that when God inspired men to write the text of the Bible... He thought, I'm going to make it so hard to understand, they'll never understand a word I'm saying. It can't be detached. He's, we are part of his creation, and therefore his creation in creating the text of the Bible, his words of what he wanted to say must also be in his creation, which means we must, to a degree, be able to start understanding what he's saying. He's never going to leave us floundering and have some need to have a university degree to understand biblical text.
And this isn't automatic. It isn't that you read it and it just makes sense. As Christians, we must interrogate the word. We must reason with the word. I did this some months ago and I talked about reasoning with it. What is God trying to say in the text? And what's the context of that chapter I'm reading? What's the context of the book I'm reading? It is possible through determined application to understand God's word. Determined application. So the question is, how do we know we have understood something that the Bible is actually communicating to us? How do we know we've understood what God is saying? Let's take conversation as an example. When you have a conversation with someone, and this is me just because of who I am, and maybe it's not you, uh, but when I have a conversation, what I tend to find is that about halfway through the conversation, I've made a conclusion about what that person is actually trying to say to me. Yeah, I know you're laughing, and that is true. Um, that is absolutely true. It's, it's, yeah. You, ne- you need to pick up on this. You might not know you do it, but uh, what happens is we, halfway through a conversation, we, we take key words out of people's, what, about what they're saying, and then go, I'm going to make up pretty much, I think this is what they're going to say, I'm going to come to a conclusion already. I'm going to, based on partly what I've heard, I'm going to do that. Uh, there was an exercise that I did many years ago for work, uh, and it was um, in some away day thing at work. And that, what they're trying to teach us was communication. And what they did was, uh, it was for about 10 minutes, and we would have to talk about eat ourselves, our personal life, uh, you know, just something about us. But no one could interrupt, and what they had to do is they gave us a pen. And no one could talk unless they had the pen. And you'd be amazed that when you start talking about things, uh, subjects that involve everyone that want to join a conversation, you'd be amazed to have people clamoring for the pen, trying to actually, I want to, I want to speak on that, I want to say something. It's amazing how we just want to jump, isn't it? We just want to make that conclusion first of all. We hear little key words and our brains go, yeah, I know where this is going. My brain's already formulating a conclusion, a conclusion without fully understanding what they are saying. I fill in the gaps without really understanding the source where it came from. I wonder if that's what we do with the Word. When we look at the Word and we kind of get enough, we've come with a certain attitude, a certain conclusion. I want to know that this, what I think is right, and I will find in the Bible something that matches what I already believe. Same sort of principle as basically saying, I'll just assume I'm right. I've not heard everything that person said. I've not read everything in the Bible of this, sub, this particular book I'm reading. But you know what? I've I read about here, and it pretty much matches already what I already think. So I'm going to stop there. It's a mistake we make. It's a mistake we make by just jump into the end or trying to find text to back up our own conclusions. You'll notice a similar method of how people talk to one another is spread to uh, TV and radio news media uh, that you'll see that they want this fast-paced question and answer. They won't let the politician answer or they won't let whoever they're interviewing answer. And they'll get one word from it or they'll hear two words from the answer and then they'll jump on that again and ask another question and maybe they're trying to create their own conclusion from what the person's actually saying. They interrupt the very person they're asking the question of so they can sculpt a response in a way that works for television, in a way that works for viewing figures. We see it on social media Video channels often manipulate, edit, and splice videos and articles for the purpose of drawing their own conclusions, taking bits out of speeches because it, it, it comes to my conclusion. If I take this, this, and this, that sounds right. That sounds what I would, what I think is saying, or they are saying. I'm trying to back up a presupposition, an already self-held view about what we already believe. So let's take a biblical example. Uh, Paul, Silas and Timothy travelled to Berea by night after escaping from uh, Thessalonica. And then they went to the synagogue of the Jews to preach and the Berean 
Jews received the preaching well when they went there. Uh, this is in Acts 17, uh, verse 11 to 12. It says, Now the Berean Jews were more of noble character than those in Thessalonica, but they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, and as, also, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. What do you think are the key verses in this? It's obvious, right? They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. This, as you're seeing your in the worksheets that I'll issue out <laughs> later, is called the inductive study method. This is what the Bereans were doing. What they said was, Paul would come and preach and he would share the message of the gospel with them. But what they didn't do, because this is protecting themselves, is to make sure that Paul wasn't, wasn't a false teacher. That he wasn't bringing a message that was false. So what they did, instead of saying, well, Paul's right, what we're going to do is we're just going to go and find scripture that, make, that makes him right. What they did was they looked at what was being presented to them. And they went to Scripture and said, is it true what Paul is saying? Not how do I back up what Paul is saying? In other words, they weren't trying to make it fit with a preconceived idea they already had. Do you see how difficult this is? When you read anything, but particularly when you read Scripture, <clears throat> we have to clear our minds of preconceived ideas. To clear our minds of what we think God's already saying, what we think he might be saying before we read Scripture. To be open to the changes that God wants to make in our lives through Scripture. And so just as they did here, we see uh, <clears throat> something, actually something that they, we're not doing today actually that, that we see in here is that um, you might know Wikipedia you go online and you can search all sorts of stuff about the world everything in it, the universe the issue that you need to know if, in case you don't know is that Wikipedia is, is contributed to by the public it's all added to by people and it's verified by people, by other people and so in the academic world, you're not allowed to use Wikipedia as a source. You might know of some universities that do, but certainly the one I've been to in more recent times did not allow Wikipedia because it's not a source uh, of uh, a verifiable fact in itself. Yeah. So you can read it, you can pick up something like Wikipedia, you can look at it and look at all the facts, and especially so, we need to be careful with Scripture here. We need to be careful with looking at things uh, of the Bible, of Christian faith, when we look on Wikipedia. It can be modified and edited by people with a different intention that might try to mislead people. So what do we do? We go back to the source. Nothing wrong with using things to help us to to get to a point of understanding, but actually at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to help us truly understand the Word is the Word. In the same way, we might in our personal time with God have a revelation from Him in regards to a particular thing we're praying about. He might help us connect uh, what we are praying about with a piece of Scripture. But we need to be careful here again. In that moment, it is, it is not, in my view, right. Just because in that very moment you had, you were praying about something and then a piece of scripture is just to take that on face value. And I go, that's what it means. And actually, I don't think we do. I think if we're honest, I think here, I, I don't know how most people read the Bible, but actually we would read into the scripture more. And that's what we need to do. During our prayer time, if God's provoking us with scripture, it is for us to understand the context of that scripture. What is he trying to say 
What did he ask the writer to say about himself so that we may know more about God? I told you this was going to get more technical. We're to study scripture to see if that conclusion or opinion is in fact true based on biblical truth. So we can come to all sorts of conclusions based on reading parts of the Bible. But is that the intention that the writer wanted to communicate? Interpretation is a process of discovering what the passage means. As we carefully observe scripture, the meaning will become apparent and so understand. But if we rush into interpretation with our accurate observation, first, our understanding will be coloured by our presuppositions. Our things that we already believe before we read the word. What we think, what we feel, what other people have said, rather than what God's word says. It's not normally in the business of teachers, preachers, to promote too much telling people to go and find the word yourself. If it's a false teacher, it's unlikely that they're going to tell you to go and discover the word for yourself. False teachers want adulation. They want all the celebrity. They want everyone to be focused on them. The last thing they want is for you to know the scripture yourself. So how do we apply God's word in our lives correctly? How do we, we always come to application? Messages, preaching, sermons should always be, end in some form of application. But in this sense, how do we apply God's word correctly in context? So one thing to understand about application is it begins with belief. Do you first believe in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again, and that you are to live a new life in him, not continue the old life, but to change your life so that you could apply what you believe in. Must believe in what you're reading. And this results in the being and doings. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, <clears throat> I mentioned about uh, when I was very young, swimming in a swimming pool, and I was getting my final certificate to go to the big person's pool, uh, public swimming baths that I was just absolutely petrified of. Didn't want to go, wanted to stay in my little kingdom of my little uh, junior swimming pool, and it was great. I could swim it, no problem. I could swim in multiple lengths, not an issue. And I told you that what uh, happened was, just as I was finishing my final certificate, I put my foot down on the ground. I didn't want to leave. Ah, oh, failed. I'm going to have to come back next year. No, no. See right through it. Teachers are very good. They see right through uh, your cunning. And he says, no, you do it again because I know you can do it. So I did it. And I did it, as I said to you before. But what really happened there was that I had already, I already knew I could do this. I already, I'd already learned enough to be able to do all the lengths and get the badges and do the certificate. I really, I fully understood that it mean if I completed the last length, I would have to take responsibility. I had no more excuses. And so it is with application. Once you know what a passage means, you're not only responsible for putting it into practice in your own life, but accountable if you don't. So often we fudge this issue a little bit, I think, in church. If there is revelation, if you've understood scripture, then we are held accountable to that scripture. We're held accountable to our understanding. God gives us grace and a chance to understand, but once we do, we have to take responsibility for that understanding. I hope it's in the right order here. 1 John 2, 3 to 6. It was the title, Love and Hatred for Fellow Believers. Um, but it starts with this. It says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. We know, we know, I knew that I could do that swimming pool length. 
we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Taking responsibility for what we know. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Wow. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. I want to tell you right now, I think I'm far away sometimes from this sentence. I think there are times when it just doesn't go right for me. When I don't live like Jesus did at all. I'm not saying to be perfect, I'm not saying in absolute perfectness. But there are times when I think I'm not doing that. You know, uh, the beginning of this verse, the beginning of this chapter, uh, it talks about grace. It talks about how, uh, I think it's on this one, it talks about how we are given grace. It's a great way of understanding. If you read this, uh, read 1 John 2 and understand the different things that's been said in here. This is a, it's an amazing, just up to verse 6 even, it's amazing what he's doing here. So he starts it with, you have grace because Jesus Christ gave it to you, because God gave you grace. We sin, but we are forgiven of those sins because of grace. And because of that forgiveness, we come to this, and he says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did, because you know that you have been given grace, and you have been saved by Jesus Christ. No excuses. I know, if I know and believe that Jesus Christ died for me and rose again so that I may live, then I must live like Jesus did, as, in as much as I can. 